Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lockcast. I'm your host, Manpreet, aka MMA Lock of the Night, and your boy on Twitter at MMA LOTN. This week we're going over UFC Vegas 5. Yes, UFC Vegas 5, headlined by Edmund Spazian versus Derek Brunson. Uh, decent card, you know, considering the, the solid card that we had last time around with Whitaker Hill, Nogir, Shogun, uh, what's the other fight? Gustafson, Verdum ton of good fights on that card this one a little less you know i mean i'm still very much interested in all of these fights obviously when you have somebody like me that looks into every single fight pretty much in depth uh you want to go in there and see uh these ver- variables go into the cage and work themselves out and see what the ending result is and how close it is based on the breakdown and prediction that we that i give you guys um so let's quickly go over last week's card uh, before we get into the breakdowns for this. So uh, we had a fire card, a bomb card. Um, it was the first event that I was actually charging the public for. Um, yeah, the first event I was charging the public for. Uh, again, once again, uh, anytime I have three event winning streak, the fourth and moving forward is going to be paid events until I take my next losing event, which is when I go back to free uh, picks. So anybody and all of the people, you know, again, very appreciative and very grateful for everybody that hopped on the Patreon uh, during that time uh, to uh, to tell me I rewarded you guys. You know what I mean? We, we had a very good event. Um, plus 7.23 units let's quickly go over each bet let's start at the top of the bet mma tips page uh one unit minus 115 on robert whitaker pretty close fight but i was confident that robert whitaker was going to go on there i thought he was going to get the the finish i thought he would be able to catch darren till but till did a good job of with his striking defense uh in terms of not eating too clean of a shot to really get dropped and hurt uh and robert whitaker did enough to to you know pretty much outpointed darren till and take home that decision victory so i was happy with that 0.87 unit profit there uh next up dog of the night play we had carlo as far as a one unit at plus 158 taking that shot every day when you when you give me a a spot where uh you have a very strong wrestler probably the strongest wrestler that we've seen rodriguez fight this entire ufc stretch uh, and again, Rodriguez being that person that has poor takedown defense, pretty much always getting controlled in the third round uh, when she fights a, a grapple-heavy opponent. I'm taking that shot. And I'll take the shot time and time again. The only regret I had on this was actually not betting more on Carla Esparza. Um, I was a little bit afraid in terms of what my, uh, Rodriguez was going to be able to do on the feet. Uh, but I did believe that Esparza's wrestling was going to be uh, the difference maker here. Uh, her tr- flight IQ in regards to going for heel hooks at the ending of that first and second round, very questionable very questionable very questionable considering how much of a vet that carla esparza is as well uh but regardless she gets a w plus 1.58 units for us there uh another dog of the night you uh play we had one unit plus 205 on half pay solo over tanner bozier bad read on my end i apologize guys that was like the only legit loss that night <laughs> but very very bad read on my end tanner bozier is the real deal uh and i look forward to possibly playing him in the future as well uh depending on if we get good lines on him another play 1.5 units at minus 123 on nogera and shogun to go over one and a half rounds we profit that at plus 1.22 units I'm very surprised at the amount of people that thought that this fight was going under one and a half rounds you guys watch the first two fights right i know that shogun got rocked in both of those first rounds in those first two fights but he was resilient he was able to get back into it and pretty much grind out nogera and all three fights went the exact same way so that over one and a half was a, a banger. I'm I'm happy to hit that one. Under two and a half, uh, under one and a half on the Hamza Chimaev and Reese McKee fight. We had two point one units to profit for one point zero two. That's pretty much like playing Chimaev. <laughs> you know what I mean? You didn't have to take the minus twelve hundred. You didn't have to take the minus four hundred on him inside the distance. Just take the under one and a half. We knew he was going to go in there. Completely grapple fuck Reese McKee on way to a finish. The, 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 <sighs> Mind blowing. I should have made that a lock of the night play. Let's be fucking honest. Uh, cash that 1.02 units. And then uh, 1.5 units on Paul Craig and Gadza Murad anti Golov under one and a half. Another one. Probably should have gone a little bit harder on this. Uh, anti Golov has gas for three minutes at most. Otherwise, he's probably either going to get tapped out or TKO'd. In this case, Paul Craig goes out there and taps him out. 
Very unfortunate finish for Antogulov. Great win for Paul Craig and a good win for us. 1.5 units to profit, 1.16 units. So that was happy with that one. Uh, did take a small stab on Tom Aspinall at plus 1700. 0.2 unit stab uh, at plus 1700 on Aspinall to win in, uh, to win by submission as he is a black belt. Uh, Jay Collier looked like absolute dog shit. And I was thinking that maybe if Aspinall dropped him, Jay Collier didn't really go out or it wasn't going to be a quick finish uh, or a quick stoppage. Aspinall was probably going to go for a choke of some sort and try to get him out that way. Uh, nope. Collier just doesn't doesn't even get to 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 pretty much hit the ground before that fight got stopped. So um, big one for Tom Aspinall minus point two units on us there. I would take that shot again, considering the jiu-jitsu credentials of Aspinall and how god dog shit uh, Jay Collier looked. And then lastly, lock of the night play five units at minus one ninety four on moves or Evluev over Mike Grundy. That cashes for plus two point five eight units. And god damn, the public was wrong here. Like. Uh, playing the Mike Grundy line to get that line even better on Moves or Evelev. I'm not sure. You know, you, you guys got to really look at the type of competition these guys are facing before going in against Evelev. Yeah, Evelev got taken down by um, Enrique Barzola in that one last fight. Didn't even hold him down that long, let's be honest. And then Grundy, you know, if you guys seen his, pretty much his last fight before the UFC, you saw how much trouble he had holding certain guys down you know certain guys he's able to hold down certain guys he's not and Moves Arvlov is another level especially in terms of the wrestling you, you know props to Grundy for having a strong first round but I do I did still score that from Moves Arvlov after uh Grundy really you know gassed himself out trying to finish that darts choke Arvlov took over you know he was able to get out of bad positions he lit him up on the feet did more damage on the feet and then he was able to pretty much cruise in those second and third rounds but uh yeah I think Arvlov's a money train and I'm sticking with him depending on the opposition obviously but to get him better than minus 200 here that was a blessing in disguise you know i'm i'm surprised that that line even got to that minus 180-ish range like god guys <laughs> i i hate sounding like a cocky motherfucker when i when i when i cash a locker then i play on certain things but when the the public is so uh, far on one side i think all right this is the livest dog on the card do a little bit more research you know what i mean like Mike Grundy has a, all he showed in that Nad Nirvani fight was that he had power and like that one two that he throw or that he threw. Nothing that we've ever seen from Movzar has ever rocked him. He's never really been hurt. You know what I mean? Like he's he has a solid chin. And then when it comes to going to a judge's scorecard, you're gonna go with the guy with more activity and the more diverse striking skill, which is Movzar Evlov. We saw a clear advantage for him and and clear improvement in his last fight where he was going out there and out striking dudes. You know what I mean? Working at Tiger Muay Thai, working with Piotr Jan, working with those guys. He's his striking game is just going to another level. Yet you guys are just confident in a guy that's, you know, holding people down that are not at the level of level of Evlov, uh, and then thinking that the the one punch is gonna be enough to put Evlov out out of here with that shit god i f i hate feeling i hate i hate being that guy but i had to do it i was just so confident in that pick anyway like i said plus 7.23 units to end the to end the event uh 54 roi happy with that solid event very strong event probably the strongest all year um and we're we're rolling man that's four straight winning events we're rolling into number five here hopefully we can secure another winning event and and keep the the paid customers happy um once again like i said if you want to join the team the best way and cheapest way for you guys the most bang for your buck five bucks a month over at the patreon i have the link in the description below you guys get all of these breakdowns that you're about to see earlier than the public you guys get all my bets uh with that five dollars a month package you guys get a best bets article as well too which i've now added props to as well so i have a, a best bets and a best props uh Pretty much, I give you guys a brief breakdown of each fight, and then I tell you what my reasoning is behind uh, the best bet uh, if I were forced to make a bet on every single fight, and what the best prop is for every single fight, too, which I did pretty well on, too. So if you guys want to help on over to the Patreon and check those out, you guys can just see that was pretty bang on with a, uh, a ton of those fights from this last card. And I, I was really good on this past card, but the Hail Mary Patreon parlay hit as well, too. So I'm hoping that my, my parlay sorry my patrons uh are, are still basking in that cash that they won uh but yeah the patreon is 
problem is tr- where I'm trying to get everybody to go over super cheap five dollars a month, and uh, it it will get me to a place where I can finally start to do this shit full time. Get you guys these breakdowns even earlier. You know, beat some of these line movements. Even if I don't make an official play, you guys can get my breakdowns. And you guys can, you know, get an edge and get a head start over most of these guys um, that are looking to hit these lines during fight week. But I'm trying to, you know, catch up to schedule, get ahead of schedule. Uh, but, you know, having a nine to five, having a family and having all that type of stuff, it, it really catches up to you. So I'm just slowly trying to release myself of that nine to five chain so I can do this for you guys full time. Uh, but yeah, check out the Patreon, early breakdowns, best bets article, best props article, uh, all my all my picks five bucks a month that's a steal right i'd say so all right let's get into these breakdowns i hope you guys enjoy them uh and yeah check them out chris gutierrez versus cody durden we got minus 350 on gutierrez and plus 290 on the ufc newcomer cody durden let's start off with chris gutierrez he looked phenomenal in his last fight against vince morales which was back at may on may 30th uh, relatively quick turnaround for him as well too. Uh, he got to finish via leg kicks. It's not often that you see that, and honestly, it was weird. I believe within the first two or three events post COVID, we saw a lot of finishes come via leg kicks, and a lot of people are really, really starting to t- uh, target the calf kick. Um, you know, Mark D. Casey is another guy that kind of comes to mind uh, in terms of having a game plan circled around uh, calf kicks, but it didn't really work out for him last time as much uh, going up against a, a master Muay Thai. Uh, practitioner in Rafael Rafael Fiziev. This time around, Cody Durden is the opponent of Chris Gutierrez. And if you watch the tape on on Durden, you see that he's uh, a wrestle-heavy type of fighter, a grapple-heavy type of fighter. And you kind of expect that from a guy that has like a what is that, a USA wrestling tattoo over his left shoulder. This, you know, you might as well be like, uh, what's his face, El Teco, uh, who's a Kunones and have jiu-jitsu tattooed across your chest, but still go out there and get ta- uh, tapped by some guys. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you see that wrestling, uh, USA wrestling logo, you kind of know what you're in for. And Cody Durden doesn't really make any bones about it. He goes in there, tries to get the takedown, and tries to pretty much suffocate his opponents. Uh, I know it's tough to find some of his footage out there. Uh, I did. There was a little birdie out there that sent me his last two fights, uh, and I did watch them, and it, it pretty much reinforces everything else that you see from his previous fights, which is go for the takedown. He's very explosive, has some decent striking, has great coaches, Anthony Rocco Martin and uh, uh, Diego Lima out of ATT Atlanta, I believe it is, or ATT Georgia. Um, solid team behind him, and he has a ton of potential. You know, that last fight that he had over, I just want to confirm the guy's name... John Sweeney, six and two. He went out there and finished him in a minute and a half. The fight before that got a rear naked choke in three minutes. The guy has a ton of finishes. He's he's a finisher. He goes out there. He looks to try to get the fight to the ground ASAP. And uh, Chris Gutierrez, on the other hand, wants to play in space. He wants to attack the legs. I think that that's kind of going to be his thing moving forward. And if Cody is not able to, you know, close the distance without eating a couple shots and uh, and addressing those calf kicks right off the bat, it's going to be a tough night for him. With that said, Chris Gutierrez, I don't believe, is very deserving of that minus 350, even though he's going up against a new UFC newcomer in Cody Durden here. I think we could see Durden take those calf kicks uh, and and swipe up that leg and make it uh, his entry. You know, I think that that just leaves uh, Gutierrez a little bit vulnerable to getting taken down. And I do believe that Durden will be able to uh, capitalize on those situations. So if you're giving me a, a wrestler who probably has the advantage here at plus 290, you got to side with him. You know, I mean, that's a ton of that's a ton of value on a guy that has a clear wrestling advantage. Now, in terms of the size and the strength, I'm not 100% sure. So that's where the question marks really start to come down. Is Cody going to have the, the the strength to go out there and take down Chris Gutierrez? I just want to confirm one thing in terms of the weight classes. So uh, Cody Durden competing at bantamweight, and this fight against uh, Chris Gutierrez is going to be a bantamweight as well too. I believe that might be wrong. I believe this is at featherweight. Either way, Tapology has had some issues in terms of uh, the weight classes being incorrect. But either way, I think Cody Durden goes out there, uh, gets takedowns consistently, grinds out Chris Gutierrez, and maybe we get a late finish from him or even a judge's decision. But uh, I think that the value here is definitely on the underdog. Um, 
And at plus 290, I, I could definitely see that line closing closer to fight time. So if you want to hop on uh, Cody Durden, you might as well do it now before the secret gets out regarding his wrestling, uh, his pedigree, and uh, what uh, he really has to offer and bring to the table. Not to mention the great uh, coaches that he has uh, behind him in Anthony Rocco Martin, who I believe right now is hospitalized. So I don't think that we're going to actually see him in the corner. But Diego Lima is always a big uh Diego and Douglas Lima, I believe, are both guys that are, uh, you know, huge in his corner and huge for his training. So uh, I like Cody Durden to win this fight by, by decision. Uh, if you see anybody out there taking Chris Gutierrez or even betting him or parlaying him or anything, they didn't watch any tape on Cody Durden and have absolutely no idea what the fuck they're talking about. So don't don't even bother playing Gutierrez here. It's either dog or pass, and I'm uh, I'd like the dog here. So I'll go with Cody Durden to win this fight via decision. Jamal Emers versus Timur Valiev. We got the new UFC uh, fighter Timur Valiev coming in at minus one seventy five, plus one fifty five for Jamal Emers. Let's start off with Emers. Uh, he's coming off a loss to Giga Chikadze. It was a split decision, and we did a. Uh, deciding splits episodes re- regarding it and i believe we actually sided with uh giga chikadze actually winning that fight you know with jamal emmers the, the the reason he lost that fight and the reason he probably lost the uh you know he made the hafiel barboza fight a lot harder for himself than he should have even the julian arosa fight which was one of the fights that i had a um a bet on him but uh very talented wrestler uses his wrestling very well his jiu-jitsu is up there as well too uh the one issue is his fight iq you know when you go out there and strike for the entire first round against giga chikazi or even the entire first round against Rafael barboza you make t- fights a lot tighter and and harder than they should be you know they should you should go out there use your wrestling pretty much every time because it seems like can you can get the takedown all at pretty much any point that you want um and if you know if you capitalize on that you're going to dominate your opponent and a submission will eventually show itself however jamal emmer seems to like to play with fire a little bit his striking is somewhat improving every every fight but it's not something that you should go out there and be like all right i'm going to go a whole round and uh and strike and see if i can either knock out my opponent or at least i'll point him enough to you know to to pocket and go into the next round um you can't do that when you only have three rounds to work with it's not a good gamble like if you go out there and you lose that then you for sure have to win the next two rounds and who knows that third round could uh, your opponent could definitely have more gas than you and that, that that's not a good look and uh considering that he's an underdog here and i think he's uh you know the line should be slightly closer um and he has a good chance of winning this fight it's hard to trust a guy with that type of uh questionable fight iq until i see him improve that and actually you know lean on his wrestling in spots where he should be more successful just as i believe he he could be in this fight uh, i'm not gonna lay money on this guy even as an underdog Timur Valiev, on the other hand, trains with Mark Henry, Frank Yedger, and uh, formerly Mar- Marlon Rice and those guys. Uh, he used to be a Jackson Wink as well, too. I believe he left those guys. But as of late, he's been with uh, Mark Henry, um, Frank Yedger. Uh, I believe that's some Barboza used to be there, too. Marlon Rice, Zabi Magomed Sherpov, all those guys. There's, there's a ton of guys uh, that he works with that are really good and really talented. And again, the, the, the mastermind of Mark Henry... Uh, you know, is very helpful for every single fighter as well, too, that that works with him. Uh, I, I like his movement. He kind of reminds me of Frankie Edgar, too, maybe with slightly better wrestling, uh, but doesn't show it as much either. Um, his volume is good. His output is good. Uh, his last loss actually came to uh, Chris Gutierrez, who also fights in the UFC. That was a split decision where a lot of people thought that Timur won that fight. Uh, even the the, the the commentators ringside believed it was a robbery. And luckily for Timur, he was able to get the rematch pretty much immediately and then won the fight uh, unanimously that time. But talking about that loss specifically, that was a fight that played out very close. Outside of the second round, which is where... Timor got him down and pretty much, you know, landed good enough shots and stayed active off of his, uh, in the guard long enough so that the referee didn't stand it up. You know, the other two rounds were very close. They were just pretty much exchanging leg kicks the entire fight uh, for those la- uh, for the first and the third round. And I feel like he may have learned a little bit from that because he has been picking up his output in more recent fights. My only issue with him is his uh, takedown defense seems a little bit questionable. Um, 
you know, there there was the uh, I'm trying to remember. I believe it was the the Costa fight, the last fight that he had. Uh, Costa got him down pretty easily, and then once he got him down, it didn't seem like uh, Valiev was really trying to implement any type of any type of jujitsu game or anything like that. He was pretty much just holding him and looking at the referee to kind of you know try to st- uh, uh, get this fight stood up. Uh, there was a point in time where Costa tried to uh, pass the guard, and that's where Valiev was able to just push off with his feet and was able to get to his uh, was able to get to his feet in that situation against Jamal Emers if Emers gets him down I'm not sure he'll allow him to get back up um you know Emers does have a solid top game um again good hands uh, solid takedowns solid top game uh everything points to Jamal Emers being a solid dog play here however um you know I just can't trust his fight IQ so I will go with Emers to win this fight uh you know th- but this is a very very close fight um yeah, it, it's tough for me to to come to a, a point where I want to bet Emers at that plus one fifty five line, and then I, you guys already know me, my rule in terms of betting on a fighter making his UFC debut, it's it's not happening. Timur Valiev could absolutely come on there, come in there and just lay an egg. You know, minus one seventy five is a little bit steep for somebody making his UFC debut who's somewhat has his fight a little bit, has his fights closer than they should be, and then obviously with that flaw in terms of his takedown defense and being uh, held down in certain spots. Um, I'm not saying that he's been absolutely held down in all of his, uh, you know, his previous fights, but in those spots where I think that Emers would excel, uh, you know, I've seen those flaws in Tamor's game. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll go with Emers to win this fight. As long as he uses his wrestling, this should be a safe fight for him. He's going to be a, the bigger fighter here as well, too. I just want to confirm the uh, the actual sizes. 5'10", 74-inch reach for Jamal Emers, and we got 5'6", 68-inch reach for uh, Timor Valiev. So, uh, a solid, solid uh, advantage for Jamal, and obviously Jamal being the featherweight, Tamar Valiev coming up uh, from ba- uh, ba- uh, from bantamweight to featherweight. So obviously Jamal Emers is going to have the size and strength advantage here, which just plays you know more into Emers's game. But again, we got to know where that mental's at. We got to know where that fight IQ is at before I can feel comfortable putting money on Emers here. But I will pick him to win this fight as I believe he has a little bit more paths to victory um, and as long as he doesn't you know go out there and try to out volume believe in that first round or that second or any round uh, he should win this fight with his wrestling uh, pretty much but uh, yeah I like Jamal Emers to win this fight by decision. Eric Spicely versus Marcus Perez we got minus 200 on Perez and plus 170 on Eric spicely uh the over under is currently set at one and a half with the over being minus 145 and i think that's kind of right um i think there's a bit of value there as i do believe that this might be a feeling out process a little bit eric spicy is a little bit wild at times but i feel like he's going to be a little bit tentative on the feet against marcus perez and uh this is a tough fight for spicy you know if he if he's not able to get perez down early and really implement his jiu-jitsu game i think he's going to have some troubles uh finishing off perez later uh, Prez, decent jiu-jitsu guy, uh, better striker obviously, a little bit wild on the feet, probably does the best joker impression that I've seen in a long fucking time, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, just google Marcus Prez, the joker, and just prepare to get freaked out pretty much, <laughs> the guy was bang on with uh, with that weigh-in performance that he had that one time, but uh in this fight against Eric Spicy, I think that's it's a, a tailor made match for, matchup for him. I think that he can go out there completely outstrike Eric Spicely, uh, do his best to keep this fight on the feet. You know, as long as he doesn't have a fight IQ gaff and you know take Spicy down and and think that he can ride him out on top, uh, he he should go out there and just piece up Spicely. I think he has a good shot of finishing him too later on the later on in the fight, as Eric Spicy is quite durable in my opinion. Uh, you know, Spicy's only shot really is to get this fight to the ground. Uh, the fight doesn't go to decision. It's minus 230. I think that's a little crazy. Again, I do like the over one and a half here at minus 145, as I do believe that, uh, again, a little bit of a feeling out process. And we will see Marcus Perez uh, pretty much outstrike Eric Spicy on the feet. And I could see him getting the f- uh, the the finish later on in the fight. Um, Perez has had such a weird, uh, you know, schedule of fight in terms of... Uh, what what's that fight that I'm trying to think of? The Wellington Terman fight was a very close fight. Um, you know, he showed off decent resilience in that fight. Uh 
by Wellington Terman was able to get the the decision victory there. Uh, his anaconda choke victory over Anthony Hernandez was a thing of beauty. He was able to hurt him to the body early in that second round, follow up a lot with a lot of punches, and eventually settled for the anaconda choke and got the finish there. Uh, poor Anthony Hernandez, man. He came into the UFC with such hype, uh, had that flawless performance on the Contender Series, and now you know he's taken uh, some tough losses against Kevin Holland and Marcus Perez. Uh, but we're talking about Perez here. Uh, you know, exchange wins wins and losses as well too. Uh, you know, lost. Eric Anders beat James Boknovich, lost to Andrew Sanchez, beat Anthony Hernandez, and then most recently lost to Wellington Terman. So if patterns tell us anything, Marcus Perez is probably going to go out there and win this fight. And again, like I said, stylistically, it's a perfectly set up match for him. Spicy just relies too much on his toughness, relies too much on uh, fights just so happening to, to end up on the ground uh, and hoping that he can, you know, use his jujitsu to really get the victory in some of his fights but i think this one's going to be a tough one against marcus perez with that said i'm not really too confident on marcus perez at minus 200 or anything like that uh i think that line is a little bit too wide even though i think this is a tailor-made matchup for him uh so uh, you know maybe in a parlay i think he that that's a good spot at but as a straight pick i wouldn't really think about you know laying that juice on him straight or that chalk uh, but I do like him to win this fight. I think he'll put out Eric Spicy later in the fight, just overwhelming him with the strikes. I uh, always see Spicy gas a little bit, and then we'll see Perez start to take over more and more. So I'm going to take Perez to win this fight by TKO via third round. Uh, well, yeah, that kind of makes no sense, but I'm taking uh, Perez via third round TKO. Ray Borg versus Nathan Mattis. We got the UFC newcomer coming in at plus 160, minus 185 for Ray Borg. Uh, let's start off with Nathan Manis. Um, I actually got familiar with Nathan due to his fight with Jesse Arnett. Uh, Jesse Arnett's a good friend of mine with, uh, you know, he, he's come over to Toronto a couple times to train, but uh, mainly a West Coast Canadian guy. But uh, the, the people in the know that know about Jesse Arnett, they know how legit uh, he is the only thing he really had working against him this entire time was that he he got into the sport of MMA too late um, and just his exclusive agreement with TKO kind of kept him away from uh, you know coming into the UFC uh, there was an instance where he was supposed to fight uh, it was either Julio Arce or Dan Ige one of those two um, at UFC 220 I believe it is one of those fights in Boston and uh, he, I believe at the time he was the champion over at T TKO and uh, the UFC offered him a spot to come in at short notice uh, to to replace one of those fighters or, or to fight one of those fighters. And uh, the president of TKO goes in there and just axes it. He's like, no, you're our champion. You have an exclusive agreement to us. You can't go over to the UFC. And that was absolute bullshit. You know, it was it was very, very uh, uh, schemish by uh, the, the TKO president over there. And what happened? Next fight... Uh, Jesse Arnett gets knocked out by Nathan Manis and the fight after that gets knocked out by Josh Hill and you know being 35 years old now Jesse Arnett's probably not getting into the UFC and that hurts me to say because I really want to see him there and he uh, he had a ton of talent you know his chin just started to fade him and uh, Nathan Manis was able to find it in his fight against him so in that fight specifically we saw Jesse Arnett take more of a, uh, a striking approach uh, kind of playing into Nathan Manis's game and a lot of people thought that he was going to eventually throw in the takedowns uh, the takedown never came you know he never really went for it he felt a lot of, really comfortable on the feet and Nathan, Man Nathan Manis made him pay by putting him out with a, a beautiful right I believe it was a his left hand actually left hand down the middle drops Jesse Arnett uh, and he follows up with a little bit of ground and pound possibly early stoppage but I'm not I'm not, I'm not uh, screaming early stoppage um, but a uh, good performance for him there next he comes in against Taylor Lapolis former UFC fighter uh, defends his bantamweight strap against uh, Taylor or defending his bantamweight strap against Lapolis uh, and Lapolis puts on a, a beautiful striking clinic on him uh, that really made Nathan Manis to like seem hesitant you know, midway through that first round, he was really hesitant in terms of what was coming back his way. Lapolis is just so good at the fundamentals and the basics of the striking game that it really made Nathan like react to pretty much any little feint, which opened up the finish for Taylor Lapolis. It ended up being a, a sidekick to the body, which uh, it was pretty much a liver kick. Uh, dropped Nathan Manis and he followed up with uh, with uh, ground and pound there and got the finish. And that was uh, Manis's only loss in the UFC. Um, his next fight, he fights a guy named three or three and two. Kellen Van Camp and uh weird to hear the broadcasters say that this could be like the you know a, a fight down the UFC it could be a, a main event uh 
you know, it was weird. Like the, that Van Camp guy did not look like a uh, a legit fighter. You know, Mattis just went in there and knocked him out in a minute and 40 seconds. And it's not a big win. They were saying it's a huge win, blah, blah, blah. I don't understand it. This Kellen guy did not look good at all. And just skimming over the rest of Mattis's record, there are a couple shady names on there. Like uh, Mark McDonald, that was another fight where, you know, he took McDonald down a couple times, you know, had a lot of... Uh, issues trying to pass the guard once he would get into a half guard he would never be able to get out of that um you know he he was never able to attain full mount um and uh, it really came down to the second round where he was able to um enforce a darts choke uh, a beautiful submission choke I'll, I'll give him that but i wasn't impressed with his ground game his takedowns you know the, the guy that he's facing seemed really low level and coming in against Ray Borg here, I think it's going to be a really, really tough chance for him to, one, get his striking going, and two, have the better of the grappling exchanges. We know what we're getting with Ray Borg. Even though he faltered last time around against Ricky Simone, he was fighting a guy that was much, much bigger than him. Nathan Manis, you know, a 135-er, previously fought at 145. He's not as big as Ricky Simone. And nor does he have the wrestling pedigree and grappling experience that Ricky Simone has as well. So I think for Nathan Maddox, this is more so of a fight that he wants to keep on the feet and try to catch Ray Borg with something. And I think he's going to have a really tough chi- really tough time doing just that. I think Ray Borg moves very well. Um, I think a lot of people believe that he's on the da- downside of his career, which is hard to believe considering he's still in his 20s. He's only 26. Uh, the kid's born in 93. He has a ton of years still ahead of him. He's just had a rough slump. Like He lose to Casey Kenny. Casey Kenny's uh, one of the higher level guys in the game. Really good scrambling and grappling abilities himself. He beats Gabriel Silva, beats Rogerio Bontarin, loses a split decision to Ricky Simone. That should have been a unanimous decision. I'm not sure what that one judge was smoking. But, uh, you know, these are not bad losses. And the fact that you're getting uh, Ray Borg at minus 185, and I believe this line actually opened up today, so we might see see some action on it uh, as the week progresses. But, man... I think that's a steal of a line, and I'm going to wait a little bit. Even uh, the minus 187 over at Pinnacle. Yeah, he was minus 175. I think he'll close closer to like minus 220, minus 250. But I'm going to keep my eye on that line. I think a lot of people are counting out Ray Borg, and they see this 10 and 1 madness coming into the UFC. Uh, you know, a solid win over, or sorry, the only loss being to a UFC vet in Taylor Lapalus. Um, yeah, I, I think the kid's being a little bit overhyped, and this fight should be lined closer, in my opinion, to minus 300, minus 250 for Ray Borg, because I truly see Borg going in there and getting a couple of takedowns and grinding this guy out and, and you know, just being a step ahead in the scrambles, just as he always is. I don't think Manis has it in him to grapple consistently for 15 minutes. He's going to be looking for that bomb, you know, every single time. He might be able to defend the first couple of takedowns, but after that, I think it's going to be all Ray Borg. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not officially saying it yet, but, uh, you know, I, I think I might have a strong play on Ray Borg. I'm not 100% sure yet. I want to see how I feel about the rest of the card. Uh, and once I get to the end of the card, which I believe will be by Tuesday or so, um, then I'll make a final decision on in terms of what I really want to play. But I, I like Ray Borg here. If you can get him at that minus 185, minus 175 line that he's at at a couple books, I'd pull a little bit of a trigger. I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, Manis is just going to be outmatching the grappling here. Um, he has shown decent takedown defense in some of his fights, uh, most notably the Kyle um, Machado fight. But I, re- I wish we saw a little bit more wrestling out of Jesse Arnett because we would have really seen how good Manis is with his grappling. Um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, rating him based off of wins over three and two guys. You know what I mean? Like, it's a sketchy experience level that he's been fighting in the past and Ray Borg's no chump you know people need to quit with the fact that this guy's on the decline you know if this if this was before the the K, uh, Casey Kenny fight we'd see Ray Borg easily at minus 350 at minus 400 so I'm taking Ray Borg and I think he could possibly even finish Madness later in the fight but I will be on the safe side I'll take him to win by decision uh, but yeah I like Ray Borg to win this fight by decision I just much better grappler and he's going to really put it on Manus and it's going to make Manus too hesitant to really throw enough of a bomb to to land cleanly on Ray Borg and we're going to see Borg just absolutely grind this fight out and show Nathan Manus that there's an absolutely different level that he has yet to compete against. Gerald Mearshart versus Ed Herman. We got minus 175 on GM3 and plus 155 on Ed Herman. Um, let's talk about Ed Herman first and foremost. This guy is somehow still in the UFC 
He made his debut all the way back at UFC, uh, or sorry, during the Ultimate Fighter 3 uh, season. He made it to the finale, I believe it is, uh, and then lost to Kendall Grove. And we're talking about 14 years ago, pretty much just surpassed the 14-year anniversary of when he had his first official UFC fight. Uh, the guy has put in years and miles and a bunch of blood, sweat, and tears into this uh, into this company. He's had fights against Nikita Krylov, C.B. Dalway, Derek Brunson, Talis Latis, Jacare Souza, Jake Shields, um, Aaron Simpson, Tim Croder, David Loazzo, Alan Belcher, Damian Maya, Joe Dirksen, Scott Smith, Jason McDonald, like so many names that vary so many different skill types. And uh, if you were able to recognize at least, you know, four of those names, props to you, hats off to you, you're probably a diehard. Um, but uh, most recently, he's actually on a two-fight winning streak. Uh, first one being over Patrick Cummins where he landed a beautiful knee on an entry from Patrick Cummins, wobbled him, threw off his equilibrium and then followed up in punches and finished him off. And then the Hadis Ibrahimov fight. We all know how shit Ibrahimov is and that's probably the only other fight that uh, Herman will be able to win at this point in his career. Um, in one of my past breakdowns I've done for this guy, you know, I've kind of pointed out the fact that I don't think he's that skilled anymore. He's lost... You know, uh, when you lose to Gian Volante, and there is an argument he won that fight too, but the fact that it was as close as it is, this guy's definitely past his prime. He doesn't really have any title aspirations. He's just going in there for a paycheck at this point in time. And um, I think this fight against Gerald Mirshar is kind of tough for him. Uh, uh, the only kind of saving grace that he has going into this fight is the fact that Gerald Mirshar is coming back relatively quickly after getting knocked out and dusted by Ian Heinrich. Uh, roughly one minute into their fight and that was only June 6th so ju this is getting close to you know uh, just under two months ago that Jordan Mirchard actually got finished uh, and that's a little bit of a concern um, what that leads me to believe is that Jordan Mirchard is going to go in here and implement his grappling right off the bat you know he's been exchanging wins his losses over his last four fights he has wins over Trevin Giles and Deron Wynn and then he's dropped fights to a split decision to Eric Anders, and then obviously getting knocked out by Ian Heinrich at UFC 250. Uh, the guy's a really well-tested Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, you know, he has a ton of submission victories under his belt. He's had 44 fights. This is going to be his 45th fight coming into the UFC. He actually fought on the Score Fighting Series, which was one of the, the shows that I used to work on back in the day uh, up here in the Ontario area. But uh, I think that... Uh, you know, outside of a first round knockout from Ed Herman, I think that this is going to be a Gerald Mearshart fight. And I truly believe the fact that Gerald Mearshart's going to be a little bit skeptical of the power that's coming back his way. He's going to try to get this fight down to the ground ASAP. And Ed Herman hasn't really showed much of a, a takedown defense or anything like that. I truly believe that he's going to have the advantage uh, when it comes to the ground. And I think he's not going to have much resistance to deal with. Uh, Gerald Mearshart's a big dude. Like the guy is 6'1", 77 and a half inch reach. Uh, but he knows how to hold his weight well on top as well. Um, he's had a lot of back and forth fights with Kevin Holland. Um, his Deron win was, fight was a little crazy too. Um, but losses to, you know, Jack Hermanson, Kevin Holland, Eric Anders, and Ian, Ian Heinish aren't the worst things in the world. Um, he's absolutely going to go in there and dust Ed Herman, in my opinion. The only concern and the only thing that's keeping giving me pause here is the fact that he got knocked out pretty good, you know, just under eight weeks ago. It's it's that's a little bit of a concern. So the thing that's catching my eye the most here is actually the under one and a half. You know, you guys know me; I'm a little bit more comfortable when it's the under two and a half. Um, but this fight, just considering the circumstances going into it, you got to believe that uh, Gerald Mearshart going to be going for that takedown right off the bat, try to get this fight to the ground and just finish him off ASAP. And knowing him, he probably wants to get into the cage quick again. You know, he fought just under two months ago, wants to get another win under his belt here with Ed Herman, probably collect a performance of the night bonus or something, and then get right back into the gym and get ready for another fight because the UFC is just handing out fights left and right. Guys are having quick turnarounds. Uh, I think it's Hannah Cyphers who's going to have her fourth fucking fight in 2020. It's either a third or fourth fight, but she's going to have the quickest turnaround. And I think Gerald Mirsha wants to get up there too in terms of having three or four fights this calendar year. And again, this is a pretty stylistically it's a good matchup for him i think he has a really good shot at getting ed herman down without eating too much damage and then uh you know pulling off some sort of submission so 
my my favorite play off the, in this fight is probably the under one and a half at plus one fifty five. I think there's some definite value there, as I think both guys have finishing opportunities and finishing opportunities early. Even though we only have seven and a half minutes, but uh, I think one of them could definitely get it done. I think the most likely outcome is going to be Joel Mirshar via submission in the first round. Frankie Signs versus Jonathan Martinez. We got minus two fifty on Jonathan Martinez, plus two ten on the rest of Frankie Signs. Uh, one thing I want to note, the under 2.5, plus 165, not a bad shot. So let's start off with Frankie Science. Uh 39 years old, very, very uh, up there in age. Uh, unfortunately, hasn't been able to fight all that much in the last three or four years uh, since his loss to Eddie Wineland. Sorry, let's just take it back to the Uriah Faber fight. You know what, let's just take it back his entire UFC career. He made his debut in 2014, and he's had three, six nine fights in six years so that just tells you alone how active he's been last time around that we saw him he got absolutely squashed by marlon vera and i think that's kind of a a sign of the end for him and i'm not saying marlon vera is a bad fighter or anything like that but when you're you know when you're getting rocked from shots by marlon vera your chin's probably not there anymore and i do believe that jonathan martinez is a slightly slightly better technical striker than marlon vera and we can absolutely see him go out there and finish frankie science um you know science strong uh, uh wrestling game he was able to go takedown for takedown against marab devalishvili say what you want about that devalishvili probably won that fight but in the henry Briones fight he was able to go out there and and you know go takedown for takedown there they had a great performance against yuri alcantara where he was uh, very dominant with the takedowns uh but i find it hard to believe that he's going to be able to keep jonathan martinez down also to stay out of uh, submission attempts from Jonathan Martinez as well, too. Um, you know, Martinez, in my opinion, got robbed in that last fight against uh, Andre Ewell. Um, very close fight. Those guys were throwing bombs. Uh, but the the size and reach advantage that Jonathan Martinez uh, is going to have here should uh, be a good indication of, you know, it's going to be tough for Frankie Sainz to close the distance and get this fight to the ground. We're talking about 5'6", 66-inch reach for Frankie Sainz, 5'8", 69.5-inch reach for uh, Jonathan Martinez. But I think uh, Martinez will be very successful in terms of keeping Sainz on the outside. And if there were any clinch positions or anything like that, I think Martinez would do a good job in terms of breaking away. Or even if this fight gets taken to the ground, I can see him doing enough damage off of his back and threatening with submissions. Uh, to potentially make this an even more difficult fight for Frankie Science. It's nuts to me. 39 years old that Frankie Science is still doing the damn thing. Uh, but I think that the UFC is just looking for him to, you know, take back to back losses here and probably give him his walking papers. Um and I think Martinez is that hitman. You know what I mean? Minus two fifty, my opinion, a little bit too steep. Uh, I'd like to see Martinez roughly around the minus 200 mark, but this is definitely a tailor-made matchup for him. As long as he's able to get, you know, stay off of his back, or at least, you know, threaten enough if he's on his back, uh, he could absolutely finish uh, Frankie Sainz, which is why I believe the under 2.5 is a great spot here. Plus 165 is not a bad line at all, in my opinion. I could see him absolutely, you know, tool up Frankie Sainz, uh, maybe you know lose that first round but then after that do enough to stay on the feet and then just put it on frankie signs to put him away later in that fight uh but yeah i do like martinez to win this fight i'm going to take him to win by second round tko i just don't think frankie science has it in the tank anymore and uh this is a very tough matchup for him to fight uh a young up-and-comer who's hungry definitely off of that last loss that he had against andrew ewell and uh i think we could see martinez make some noise in this division he just needs to continue to grow continue to get some uh wins under his belt some experience under his belt and this is a great uh experience uh fight for him to go up against a, a strong grappler like frankie science unfortunately for frankie though it's just a little bit too past uh his prime uh and i think he's just going to be you know uh outgunned in pretty much every way in this fight so i'm taking martinez and i'll take him to win this fight by second round tko Kevin Holland versus Trevin Giles. We got minus 190 on Kevin Holland, plus 165 on Trevin Giles. And it seems like we've been getting a little bit of money coming in on Trevin Giles here. Uh, from what I remember, I've been seeing Kevin Holland throughout the week at the minus 200, minus 220 range. And it seems like money 
like I said, is coming in on Trevin Gauss here, which is kind of interesting after I run the tape myself. Uh, one uh, line I do actually want to point out here is the over one and a half, minus 185. Not that bad of a line considering I believe that this would be uh, a bit of a, a grapple fest to begin with. I don't think they're, they're going to be striking for too long on the feet. Um, you know, I do like Trevin Gauss's jab. I think he has a, the stronger and more technical strikes here. Uh, but Kevin Holland, on the other hand, is a little bit of a wild man. Likes to throw spinning stuff, likes to get crazy in there, likes to have fun. Uh, but it really comes down to the grappling of both of these guys. Something to note with Kevin Holland, uh, he just recently received his black belt from Travis Luter, uh, you know, which is a very high accomplishment for himself. And uh, I'm sure he's going to want to go out there and test it out against Trevin Gauss, who in my, uh, I believe... Is a brown belt the last time I uh, yeah uh, the last time he fought James Kraus, John and I called out that he was a he was a brown belt after he gutted out a beautiful uh, a rear naked choke attempt from James Kraus in that first round. But yeah, uh, Kevin Holland, I feel like he's gonna he has a little bit of a chip on his shoulder with you know uh, achieving that black belt. So I could absolutely see him going in there and trying to like grapple fuck Trevin Gauss on route to some sort of submission victory later in that fight. But I don't think Trevin Gauss is going to go out without a, go down without a fight, just like the the James Cross fight. Uh, you know, he toughed out that rear naked choke, and I feel like I feel like Kevin Holland could possibly finish that. You know, no no shot at James Cross here or anything like that. But uh, I feel like if Kevin Holland got that position, he could probably get, uh, notch the finish. But uh, I feel like we will see a little bit of a stalemate between these guys uh, in that first round and a half or so, which will allow the over one and a half to hit, in my opinion. With that said, uh, I still like Kevin Holland to win this fight. You know, I'm not super and overly impressed with Trevin Gauss here. And yeah, the line may have been a little bit uh, wide at first, but now that it's closing a little bit, Kevin Holland at minus 190 is not that bad of a line. Um, I feel like um, people, I kind of feel like Kevin Holland is like the, the Cowboy Oliveira of this middleweight division. You know, he he has great performances and then sometimes he go out and goes out there and just shits the bed. You know, he had a great performance last time around against Anthony Hernandez, uh, but the performance bef uh, before that, he got finished by Brendan Allen. And he had a solid performance there. Brendan Allen is just on the way up right now, and, uh, you know, he's been looking great, uh, you know, pretty much in his entire UFC run. Uh, that Gerald Mearshaw fight was was a, was a, was a banger, man, uh, at least in terms of jiu-jitsu and grappling. These guys were back and forth, endless reversals. Gerald Mearshaw was the one that ended heavy uh, and ended on top in terms of, like, really putting it on and holding up uh, Kevin Holland in those later rounds. But I feel like even though we saw possibly some cardio issues from Kevin Holland in that fight, I feel like he has better cardio than Trevin Gauss here. So if this fight is high pace in that first round and a half or so, I feel like we'll see Kevin Holland have a little bit more success later in the fight. Uh, I find it interesting that Trevin Gauss has both of his losses in the UFC in the third round. Uh, both two uh, jiu-jitsu guys, or primarily jiu-jitsu guys, uh, Zach Cummings, Gerald Mirshar, both guillotine chokes in the third round in back-to-back -back fights. That's kind of unfortunate. I feel like I have a, a sneeze coming on right now. I'm trying to get rid of it. Regardless, let's get back to this breakdown. Uh, you know, obviously we know the circumstances surrounding that James Krause fight. Uh, Antonio Hoyo fell ill on weigh-in day. James Krause was supposed to be cornering, I believe, Zach Cummings that night. Uh, is it was it Cummings? It was one of those uh, one of those guys. Let me just nope. Could have been Yusuf Zalal. I don't know why it's bugging me so much that I need to figure this out. But uh, he was... Yeah, he was uh, scheduled to be in one of their corners this weekend. It probably even would have been uh, Yusuf Zalal. But regardless, uh, he was supposed to corner one of those guys in he steps against Trevin Gauss on super short notice and puts up a decent fight. And you could actually even say that uh, James Cross deserved to win that fight. You know, we heard about some of the shadiness in terms of the judge... Um, Joe Solis, uh, who has a bit of a connection to Trevin Giles, but uh, both other judges scored round one for uh, James Krause, and he was the only one that scored it for uh, Trevin Giles, which is very, very shady. You know, when you have the guys back for pretty much three and a half to four minutes, and then Giles had a little bit of success in the last 30 to, to one minute, 60 seconds, uh, 
you know, I, I don't think that's enough to warrant winning the round. James Krause definitely won that round. And then obviously a lot of the judges gave him round three as well. Split decision loss for James Krause, but uh strong case that he probably won that fight. Uh, with that said, that again, that's a little bit of a, a cardio issue with Tre- Trevin Giles that we saw in that third round. Uh, James Krause, again, took the fight on super short notice. Looked like he was fitting in that second round. Got a second win in the third round. Really put it on Trevin Giles with the striking, calf kicks, and just continuous forward movement. And Trevin Giles pretty much had nothing in return. I feel like if that was Kevin Holland, we'd see Kevin Holland, you know, throwing spinning shit, having a lot of success with his striking, and then eventually mixing in a takedown uh, to possibly, you know, get some sort of submission. I just don't see, uh, you know, besides the underdog money that you potentially get on Trevin Giles, I just don't think it's warranted. Like, I don't know, uh, I don't mean, I don't think it's warranted in terms of making a bet on it. I just don't see the value on him at, at plus money. Uh, you know, he was a solid fighter on the LFA scene, even had a win over Ryan Spann. But uh, yeah, nothing from tape shows me that he's going to really give Kevin Holland any problems outside of a potential first round submission or something like that I, again i just don't see that so i'm going to take kevin holland to win this fight by third round submission and he's going to show off that black belt that he just got from uh travis Luter. so uh kevin holland third round submission uh and not that bad of a line at minus 190 in my opinion bobby green versus lando venato we got minus 145 for lando and we got plus 125 for bobby green this is the second time they are fighting, and this one kind of caught me off uh, off guard a little bit. Um, you know, as you guys know, I put together the tape index, and uh, you know, Newsom uh, sends me a message a couple of days ago to be like, "Hey, just so you know, there's just two fights that you're missing for this upcoming card." And I'm like, "What are you talking about? I just sent you a fucking update, you know, uh, a day prior." And he goes, oh, no, they just announced uh, Green, Venata, and then obviously Gutierrez and Durden. I was like, holy shit, this fight came together pretty quickly. Um, but I guess it doesn't really matter considering this is a fight that's uh, that's happening again. You know, they, they fought back at UFC 216 back in uh, October of 2017. It ended up going to a draw, but... Um, you know, if it wasn't for that illegal knee from Lando Venata in that first round, he probably would have walked away with the decision victory in this fight. Um, it, you know, upon rewatching that illegal knee, uh, it really was like the inside of his thigh slash his hip, which, uh, you know, connected with Bobby Green. And uh, I'm not saying, you know, that that shouldn't have warranted a, a point deduction. Obviously, it does. Uh, and he knew right away, pretty much as soon as he landed it, he knew what the fuck was up. Like, you can see the reaction in his face where he's just like, ah, fuck, I, goddamn. But uh, he didn't really let him deter that, him from the rest of that round. He really got back into the game. And, uh, you know, questionable decision there. Uh, in that second round, Bobby Green really put it on him and really bloodied him up. And it was unfortunate for the aesthetic look of the the blood coming out of Lando Venata's uh, nose. Uh, that must have really swayed the judges for sure. But uh, obviously, he got that one point taken away, and that was very detrimental to him to actually winning this fight. Um, you know, since then, Lando Venata has put together a decent run. You know, could have been better. Uh, so he lost to Drakkar Close, had a draw with Matt Frivola, beat Marcos Mariano, which is probably just a, a toss-up fight, uh, lost to Mark Diakese, and then beat Yancy Medeiros. And now here he is once again fighting Bobby Green. Uh, I find it hard to believe that it's going to go any different than the first one, other than the fact that um, I feel like we see a little bit more confidence from Lando Veneta. We saw that perfectly in the Yancy Medeiros fight, where we saw him kind of go back to his like groovy style, which was just hands down, a lot of movement, um, you know, jumping in and out with his shots very quick, um, really luring his opponents to him and then just lunging forward and kind of trying to catch them off guard. And I think that's going to be very successful against a guy like Bobby Green here who throws very low output. Um, you know, Bobby Green looked good in his last fight against Clay Guida, who was the, the slightly slower fighter. Um, I did pick Guida to win that fight as I thought that Guida's output was going to be the difference maker. But I am even more confident here in Lando Venata. Um but the only issue, though, is with Lando Venata, you can't be 100% confident all the time. Uh, the, there are weird versions of him that come out every now and then. You know, considering his performance that he had against Tony Ferguson when he made his UFC debut on short notice, a lot of people had a high ceiling for him. And he hasn't really, you know, met those, met those uh, expectations that we had for him. He came into the UFC 
with a uh, eight and zero record. Obviously, his first loss was Tony Ferguson, but has traded a bunch of wins and losses in the meantime. Uh, he did beat John McDesi by a very, very impressive spinning wheel kick. Wheel kick that actually happened in Toronto. I was live for that fight. That one was very fun. But in terms of uh, this fight against Bobby Green, uh, I do expect him to kind of kind of look like kind of look like the first fight maybe with a little less blood from Lando Veneta uh but a little bit like the Yancey Medeiros fight as well too where we see him a little bit cocky with the hands down moving a lot and just letting Bobby Green walk towards him uh Bobby Green you know just he's kind of like a one and done puncher he's a very talented but I'm, I just it's hard to back him like the, he he has this lackadaisical approach to his fighting style which really makes it uh, not judge-friendly because more often than not, most of his fights do go to a decision. And then if you're just not that, like, um, you know, if you're not that offensive, you're going to have a lot of issues trying to, um, you know, get the judge's nod. So I do like Lando Venata in this fight. I do think we see him dance around a little bit. And I do think we see him, uh, you know, get the judge's decision here. As long as he doesn't throw no illegal shit, this should be at least a 29-28 for him at worst. Uh, Maybe he gives up one round, uh, but I can absolutely see him going out there. Avoiding the big shots of Bobby Green, uh, you know, he did get touched up late in that fight as well the first time around, which probably swayed the judges a little bit too. But uh, I do expect him to play a, a little bit safer and a cleaner of a fight this time around. And I do expect him to go out there and get the de- uh, judges' decision uh, en route to a three-round victory or a three-round decision victory. The Chente Luque versus Randy Brown. We got minus 185 for Vicente Luque and plus 160 for Randy Rude Boy Brown. Um, let's start off with Luque. So 18-7-1, coming off a uh, victory over Nico Price last time around at UFC 249. Uh, Dropped a fight to Stephen Thompson before that, but then had a pretty solid win streak going on uh, since his loss to Leon Edwards way back in 2017. But one thing that's been uh, quite evident with uh, Vicente Luque, or it it just seems that way, is uh, his striking defense seems to have been taking a little bit of a hit. Um, Pun intended. Uh, you know, he's been taking a lot of damage in his fights, you know, since the pretty much the Brian Barbarena fight, the Derek Kranz fight was pretty quick, so he was able to get him out pretty quickly. The Mike Perry fight, he took a shit ton of damage in that fight. Uh, Wonderboy Thompson obviously just lit him up the entire three rounds, dropped him a couple times as well, too. Uh, and then the Nico Price fight, you know, Nico Price looked pretty freaking good for, you know, that two and a half rounds that he was going before it got stopped via doctor stoppage uh i believe most uh judges had that scored for vicente luke or at least had a 1-1 and then they were obviously going to give him round three because it was going his way but uh you know he's still a talented guy you know you you gotta look over the fact that uh, uh he's as hittable as he has become because Randy Brown isn't like a huge like knockout puncher or like a one punch knockout type of guy. He needs to get a couple punches in and get a combination going, to, and and really beat his opponent with um, with with, uh, with volume with output. And I feel like here, uh, Randy Brown's going to be completely outgunned on the feet. Yeah, he might be a little bit successful. But I think once Vincente Luque really starts getting his game going, especially the leg kicks, I think it's going to get very tough for Randy Brown. And I truly see uh, Luque, you know, pretty much picking apart Randy Brown anywhere that he wants his fight to go. Uh, I think Randy Brown's being a little bit, it, it could be both things. It could be the fact that, you know, Luque t- has taken a ton of damage uh, over the past couple fights. And Randy Brown has went over Warley Avos last time around. And uh, the Alves fight was quite. Uh, you know, quite depressing. Quite depressing if you're a Warley Alves fan. You know, he got a pretty good top control against uh, Randy Brown in that first round, and then he pretty much just gassed himself out, and Brown was able to take over from that point. Like that triangle that he sunk in was pretty half-assed, and that really was a, a contribution towards uh, Warley Alves's, um, uh, you know, shitty gas tank, if you were to call it that. And then we all know Brian Barberina has pretty much fallen off a cliff uh, over the past couple fights. Uh, obviously, he had that war with Luke as well, too. That must have taken it out of him. But uh, I don't think that Randy Brown's that that big of a threat here. You know, unless he somehow summons some crazy knockout power or one-punch knockout power, I don't see how he goes out there and finishes Luke. Um, you know, he his wins are a little salty. His best wins are probably Warley Alves and Brian Barberina. 
you know, he lost to Nico Price, he lost to Bilal Mohammed, he lost to Mike Graves, wins over Ma- Matt Dwyer, Eric Montano, uh, Brian Camozzi, Mickey Gall. It took him three rounds to beat Mickey Gall. Um, yeah, you know, I don't even want to know what Vicente Luque would do to Mickey Gall uh, in that amount of time. But uh, yeah, Randy Brown obviously also has only uh, accumulated two knockdowns in his entire UFC career. Uh, I forgot who, I believe Alves was one of them, or Barbarino was one of them, but the other one was definitely Brian Camozzi, and we know how well his UFC t- uh, career turned out. But I truly think that uh, Vicente Luque is just a much better technical fighter, and it's truly going to come down to the leg kicks. You know, Randy Brown stands pretty wide. Uh, that leg is definitely there to be kicked. I think we'll see Vicente Luque, you know, pretty much target that throughout the fight, and that's going to allow him to really uh, get his uh, his hands going too. I don't think we'll ever see Vicente Luque at this type of line against this type of competition in any t- in the near future at all. Uh, the one line that is actually quite intriguing to me is the over one and a half. Uh, we got minus 170 currently for that line. And I truly believe that this could be a bit of a feeling out process at first. You know, Luque taking his time to to establish his leg kicking game, to establish his hands, and then slowly start taking, out, uh, taking over later in the fight. Minus 170 isn't too bad of a line. In my opinion, I think that uh, uh, Luque has uh, all the tools to push this fight past that seven and a half minute mark and then really take over after that. Uh, it's tough for me to see how Randy Brown wins. And I'm seeing a lot of love out there for Randy Brown with some of the with 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 some cappers. Uh, and I think it's starting to turn into that uh, that Mike Grundy thing from last week where it's just a bunch of people like, all right, Randy Brown's the play. He's the best valued underdog on this card, apparently. So we're all just going to jump on him. I don't think so. I think people are counting out Luque. Uh, the guy's massively talented. I still don't think Randy Brown's at that level yet. Uh, and we'll see Vicente Luque probably finish this fight later in the third round. I'd say probably uh, late second, early third round, we see him get uh, Randy Brown out of there. It's just going to be too much firepower on the feet for Brown to deal with. Um, again, unless he one punch KOs Vicente Luque in that first round. I highly doubt we see that. Uh, maybe a knee, a, a flying knee of some sort, uh, or a knee up the middle when Vicente Luque is throwing a combination. But outside of that, Luque's got this fight in the bag. And I wouldn't even be surprised to see Luque actually take this fight to the ground and utilize his jiu-jitsu. Like, I think he'll have a huge uh, jiu-jitsu advantage here as well over Randy Brown. So I'll go with Luque to win this fight uh, by third round TKO. Uh, and yeah, I like him at this line, and I, I I will say it. I am slightly concerned about the damage that Luke has taken over the last couple of fights. So it does give me like if it if those fights never had happened, and you know it, he never took that amount of damage, and 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 still had the similar outcomes, I'd probably be laying a giant uh, wager on Vicente Luque here. But you know at the minus one eighty five range, still not that bad of a bet to be honest. Uh, but uh, I could obviously say that I would be way more confident in Luque had those fights and that damage never occurred. But I still don't think it's going to be too much of a factor here, which should still allow him to come away with the third round victory. Joanne Calderwood versus Jennifer Maya. We got minus 160 on Joanne Calderwood, plus 140 on Jennifer Maya. Let's start off with the former title challenger or to be title ta- challenger and Joanne Calderwood uh, she was actually supposed to fight Valentin Shevchenko I believe Shevchenko got hurt and Joanne Calderwood just did not want to sit on the shelf so she accepted this fight against Jennifer Maya uh, you know completely understand that even though Jennifer Maya is coming off a loss to Caitlin Chukagin uh, Chukagin was the last one to fight for a title so it's not really a step back in terms of uh, for Joanne Calderwood so uh, let's start off with Jojo. You know, she's made a lot of evolutions in her fights, um, or at least in her fighting style. I, I remember her all the way back in 2012 when she made her, when she fought for her second UFC or pro MMA fight on Super Fight League. Um, you know, Super Fight League was in, uh, I'm not sure if it's still around, but it was a, an up and coming MMA promotion over there in India, you know, backed by some big Bollywood stars. And a lot of people had high hopes for it, uh, including myself, too. I'm like, hey, brown guys getting into the MMA. Uh, I'm totally behind that. Uh, obviously, it crashed and burned. <laughs> uh, Bob Sapp headlined a couple fights. And yeah, it just never really worked out over there. Uh, they even tried going like a, a team style based like IFL type of shit, but uh, never worked out. But I do remember Joanne Calderwood fighting uh, Lena Ovchenikova. 
probably butchered that. Uh, and I thought she was pretty green. And obviously, it was her second MMA fight, so it kind of makes sense. But, uh, you know, how long ago? Two years after that, she finds herself on The Ultimate Fighter, loses to, ru- lo- loses to Rose Namajunas on the show, uh, but still manages to get a UFC contract, and she's been in the UFC ever since. Uh, she's compiled a record of... Uh, six wins in the UFC, which is very, very um, surprising, actually. Six wins, what is that? Six and three, six and four in the UFC. Uh, I don't know why the fuck I thought she had more wins, but uh, she is, you know, ever-evolving. She's getting better and better in every single fight, and the win over Andrea Lee last time around is a big chip on, you know, like a, it's a good notch on her belt. Um, Lee is, you know, even though she lost a fight to, to Lauren Murphy recently, uh, Andrea Lee's no joke. She's she's one of the higher-level women at this weight class, uh, and JoJo was able to do a good job in terms of mixing up the fight, getting the fight to the ground every now and then, and, uh, you know, really making it difficult. I did lose a good chunk of change on Ariane Lipsky when she made her UFC debut against Joanne Calderwood, where Calderwood really, you know, kind of a 2.0 version where she went out there and, and really started to wrestle a little bit more and, and instead of just focusing on her striking, and it paid off for her. Um, Catelyn Chikagian obviously got the better of her in that fight, uh, but again, the Andre Lee fight, we saw a little bit more uh, improvement for her. There is an argument that you could have given that fight to Andre Lee as well too, but this fight against Jennifer Maya is just very... Uh, I think it's a little bit more tailor-made for her. Uh, we know JoJo's background is Muay Thai and it is kickboxing, so they're pretty much, uh, you know, g- going to be, uh, the strengths are going to be going up against each other. I will give the slight advantage in the terms of the Muay Thai and the power to Jennifer Meyer, as I do feel like she's a little bit more polished on the feet. Uh, she throws with a little bit more conviction. She throws with a little bit more heat, but... That's where I think it really opens up for Jojo Calderwood to mix this fight. Uh, it got kind of lull Jennifer Maya into thinking it's going to be a striking battle and then eventually take her to the ground. Uh, yeah, and, and that one thing alone is kind of enough for me to to be like, all right, you know, going into this fight and going into taping this fight, I was thinking that there's going to be a little bit of value on Jennifer Maya and I just can't keep uh, or, or I just can't, uh, you know, trust Maya. Uh, with the lack of get-up game that she had. You know, when Alexis Davis got her down in that second round and she pretty much just laid on top of her for that, and for you know, three and a half, four minutes, is very demoralizing thinking that, okay, Jojo Calderwood is probably going to be able to do that as well too. And if Calderwood looks at the tape, she's going to know that's a bit of a weakness for Jennifer Maya. So we can absolutely see Jojo go out there, take Jennifer Maya down and make it uh, a grinding, boring uh, type of fight where she actually secures a victory, you know, pretty unanimous. Um, yeah I like you know I do like Maya on the feet but there's just too much cause for concern there in terms of uh, her getting taken down she legit had like no get up game it it was kind of sad she did retain guard pretty well every now and then she did give up half guard every uh, pretty often too but she was able to retain guard but still uh, just not enough, uh, you know, re- resistance on the ground that I saw from her that made me believe that if JoJo gets her down, Jennifer Maya is probably not going to get back up, and that's kind of concerning. Minus one sixty for JoJo Calderwood, not bad, pretty pretty decent price tag, I'd say. Um, you know, I do believe she'll win. I, you know, she's married now or at least engaged to a J- J- John Wood, uh, the guy over at Syndicate, head coach over at Syndicate. So she's, she's been able to really get a proper training in. Um, you know, training pretty much all the time. She knows that a title shot is very, very, uh, very much in the near future. So I'm sure she's always just keeping the foot on the gas. And uh, this Jennifer Maya fight is going to be a great learning experience for her. Uh, you know, with the solid win here, if she's able to endure the striking of Jennifer Maya uh, and still get her game going uh, with the takedowns and all that stuff, I think it makes it a lot easier for her to to, to go out there and get the victory. So I am going to go with JoJo to win here. Um, minus 160 again, not a bad price tag. The line is closing a little bit, so there is a little bit of love coming in on Jennifer Maya, but I think it's unwarranted. Uh, and I do believe that uh, Jojo Calderwood should win this fight, and I'm going to take her to win this fight via decision. Derek Brunson versus Edmund Shabazian. We got minus 330 on Shabazian, or Eddie Shah, as my boy Gabe Killian likes to call him, uh, and plus 270 on Derek Brunson. Uh, this is currently lined at minus 370 to not go to a decision. So the thing to remember here is the fact that this fight is somewhat short, uh, 
short notice to be a main event because this was actually supposed to be headlined by Holly Holm versus Irene Aldana. Aldana tests positive for the COVID in steps Brunson and Shabazian, but apparently we're only getting three rounds of this main event. So that's something definitely to keep in mind. Uh, so let's start off with the UFC vet, Derek Brunson, 20 and 7, coming into this fight with a two fight winning streak over Elias Theodoru and Ian Heinish. Um, they were, uh, Shabazian and Brunson were actually scheduled to fight a couple times, finally getting it lined up for this weekend. And, um, this is probably going to be the toughest test for Shabazian coming into this fight. Um, we've only seen him outside of the first round one time, and that was against Darren Stewart, who is primarily a striker, probably a better technical striker than Edmund Shabazian at that time, and just due to the, the youth of Edmund. The kid's only 22 still. He has a ton of time to grow, a ton of time to, to gather experience and to gather the tools that are needed to become a UFC champion. But we really saw him tested in that fight, in a fight where he was the one initiating the grappling from the get-go. Um, I think he was just a little bit tentative and and nervous of the power that was coming back his way from the more technical striker and Darren Stewart. Whereas these other fights against Charles Bird, Jack Marshman, and Brad Tavares, I believe he thinks he was, or he thought he was the better striker, and it definitely showed. Well, at least in the Jack Marshman fight, he takes him down pretty much immediately, you know, sinks in a rear naked choke. That's pretty much like, you know, Hamza Chmaev going in there and taking down Reese McKee and taking down John Phillips and then eventually getting a submission or a TKO. So that's kind of a given. You know, he has decent wrestling. It obviously showed in the Marshman fight. It showed enough in the Darren Stewart fight, even though he wasn't really able to hold Stewart down and do much damage from those positions. Charles Bird fight, Bird goes in for a takedown, struggles, and then gets Travis Brown elbowed to death pretty much. Um, but Bird looked significantly smaller than Shabazzian in that fight. We got 6-2 for Shabazzian, 6-1 for Brunson. Uh, slight reach advantage for Brunson as well too, something to keep in mind. Uh, but, uh, you know, Tavares actually seemed like somebody that was roughly around his size. And Brunson is one of the bigger middleweights as well too, so that's something to keep in mind here. Um, I don't think we're going to see Shabazzian going in there and and try to you know wrestle fuck Brunson. We know Brunson will probably be the better wrestler. We saw a lot of people doubting Brunson last time around against Ian Heinish. I was one of them too, and you know Brunson still showed us that he has it. Uh, you know he's not a complete like toss up for a, or or a, or a, a can fight for some of these guys. You know Ian Heinish was supposed to go in there and wreck Derek Brunson. Brunson showed resiliency in that first round where he got rocked, and the second and third he comes back, utilizes his wrestling a lot better and just outstrikes Ian Heinish. I'm interested to see this fight if it goes into the second round. You know, um, can Shabazzian go in there and absolutely, you know, dust Derek Brunson in that first round? Probably. He could probably, you know, he has the sharpers, faster hands, um, you know, hit his one-two down the middle, especially the one that he initially caught Brad Tavares with before he ended him with that uh, that head kick knockout. It was beautiful. Like, it was fast. It was a piston uh, right down the middle. But my question is when he's not able to put these guys out. And Brunson has been knocked out in the past. You know, Adesanya, obviously, uh, Jacques Ray Souza, Robert Whitaker. Uh, Shabazian definitely has the power to do it. I think that... Um, that's probably the most likely outcome, but in terms of getting, you know, legit odds on betting that, you're getting minus 260 on Shabazzian to win inside the distance. That's a little bit crazy, in my opinion. Um, my, minus 330 even for him is a little bit crazy. I know a lot of people are on this train, and initially when this fight was booked, he was like a minus 145 or minus 150 favorite, and now all this love is just starting to come in on uh, Shabazzian, and I'm honestly... I'm kind of saying pump the brakes a little bit. The kid's still young. He, you know, beats a old and withered Charles Bird, uh, who was, you know, strength-wise was completely outmatched. Size-wise was completely outmatched. Uh, Jack Marshman, do I even need to say anything about that? Uh, and then uh, who's the last one? Brad Tavares. Probably, you know, like a middle-of-the-road uh, middleweight at that time. Um, you know, not the greatest fighter, never really peaked, um, you know, hasn't really fought the type of competition that Derek Brunson's fought. Uh, my only concern here for Derek Brunson is honestly just getting clipped in that first round. If he's able to keep that or if he's able to, you know, kind of clinch and grind uh, Edmund against the cage and suck that power out, I wonder what Edmund has left in the second and third round. And I'm not banking on Shabazzian to go out there and knock this guy out in the first round. Um, it's possible, obviously it's possible, but, 
I really need to see this kid in the second and third rounds before I can be completely, you know, satisfied and and uh, you know, be on the train. I need to see more from him. It's kind of like Tom Aspinall from last week. You know, we we know this guy has a bunch of first round finishes on his record. Uh, got fed another can here in Jake Collier. If we got Jake Collier even at like two hundred and twenty pounds, two hundred thirty pounds, somebody who even gave a fuck about fighting, we may have seen Tom Aspinall. You know, t- tested a little bit more. Unfortunately, we didn't. Here we get a kind of a similar situation where you're getting a guy that seems really, really good. Uh, but the one fight that we saw him go at three rounds, uh, you know, it looked really, really, really tough for him in that third round. Um, you know, luckily for him, he had the grappling and um, and, and wrestling advantage over Dar- Darren Stewart, which is why he was able to really nullify the strikes coming back his way in that third round and really kind of saved him in that situation. But here against Brunson, if Brunson has the better gas tank going into that third round, you know, Shabazi is not going to be able to clinch fuck him. You know, Brunson is really good, uh, you know, solid takedown defense, is able to, you know, get out of bad situations in terms of like clinch, getting clinched up against the cage or anything like that. I don't think Shabazi will have uh, the, the power expertise or the technique to be able to keep Brunson there. So I can't believe I'm saying this, but going into the going into this fight, it's kind of like dog or pass and i know i'm gonna get a lot of shit on that especially from that one fucking guy that always comments on all my youtube videos whenever i fucking break down an edmund shabazi and fight he's like never bet against edmund i get it you love the guy get his dick out of your mouth you know what i mean let's just leave it at that um but every fighter is gonna take their first l and that first l is always going to be very very uh helpful it's going to teach them a lot a part of me thinks that it could be Brunson that gives him that first L, you know, like my my only concern for Brunson in here is getting put out in that first round. That's when Shabazzin is going to be the, the hardest hitting. That's when he's going to be the sharpest. That's when he's going to be the fastest. That's when he has the best gas tank. But I want to see him in the second round. I want to see him get pushed. I want to see, you know, him survive Derek Brunson pushing him up against the cage for that first round um, and then come out in that second round and put him out. That would make me, that would leave me more impressed than if he were to just go out there and dust Brunson in that first minute. But I think this line's a little bit wide. And I truly believe that we could see Brunson squeak out a decision here. I could see him, you know, holding Shabazzian up against the cage, taking him down. Um, you know, uh, it's, I got to see what Shabazzian's ground game is like in terms of being off of his back. Um, you know, he's just been dusting guys pretty much with with his hands. He has a couple rear naked chokes under his belt too, but, you know, not against guys of Brunson's level, in my opinion. Um, Brunson is obviously the best guy he's faced to this point in time. And I need to see him pass a test like Brunson. Even if he beats a guy like Brunson, I still need to see him against a guy like even better than him. Um, you know, people are saying he's the, you know, he's the one, he's the chosen one. He's going to come in there and, and dust all these middleweights, but I'm not... I'm, <sighs> Yeah, it's impressive, you know, taking out Brad Tavares, that's probably his most impressive win, but that Darren Storm fight was very, very concerning. If this guy's sucking win like that in the, in the third round against a guy like Brunson, and even in the second round, like he could have probably been more gassed in that second round if he was facing more opposition in terms of the, the grappling, so... You know, with this being a smaller cage, there's a there's an argument on both sides. You know, there's the argument that a smaller cage equals more violence, or a smaller cage allows Brunson to, you know, push Edmund up against the cage a little bit earlier and a little bit quicker, which would allow for him to really implement his game of just grinding on him. And at the current odds, minus three thirty for Shabazian, I'm passing on that. You know, I'm going dog here. I would rather put the money on Brunson at the plus 240 plus 250 range then actually you know put the money on Edmund Shabazz at minus 330 now if this was like minus 140 minus 145 like it initially opened I'd probably be confident in putting in a bet on Edmund especially him inside the distance you know at that point it would maybe be minus 110 minus 120 for him inside the distance but this minus 260 minus 330 is a little bit crazy let's not get let's not get out of hand here like Let's not jump the train on this kid that's still like a work in progress. You know, let's not forget this guy trains with Edmund Traverdian. Like everybody is just, everybody used to rag on this guy so much and now he has a bright prospect and now we're all thinking that he's fucking, uh, you know, the the craziest and best coach out there once again. Let's pump the brakes a little bit. Let's come back to reality. Let's see Edmund pass this test. And uh, again, I don't think he would have passed the test if he goes out there and, you know, finishes Brunson in the first round again. Uh, and I just need to see him in the second and third rounds before we really start to, you know, before we really start to to, to ride this guy's coattails. Um, 
you know, when he does f- start finding the top fives and the top tens, I think Brunson's in the top ten as well too, but when he starts finding those top five guys, you know, just having that not that one punch knockout power type of thing in the first round is not going to cut it. These guys are going to be able to eat it, and then what do you got left? That's my concern with Edmund here. So uh, I'm, I'm going to get so much shit for this, but if he comes out on top, I'm going to look like a fucking genius. So uh, I'm going to go with Brunson here. I'm going to go with Brunson via decision. I see him just, you know, pushing Edmund against the cage. He's going to be the stronger fighter. He's going to be the better wrestler. Um, I want to see what Edmund's ground game is like off of his back. Uh, there's just too many questions, in my opinion, about Edmund. And we did, again, you got to pump the brakes on these guys that are just going out there and getting quick finishes. And then the one time or two times that we see them outside of the second round, you know, they may still pull off the victory, but they just don't look good. And uh, again, I did. I, I'm not, I'm not, I was not impressed with Edmund in that fight against Darren Stewart. And uh, again, my only concern here for Brunson is his possibly weakened, you know, dusted chin uh, in that first round. But if he's able to implement a, a good game plan in terms of just pushing Shabazzino up against the cage and, and draining him that way, maybe taking him down and then starting to do work in the second and third rounds, I think he has a, he has a good shot here. So I'm going to go with Brunson to win this fight via decision and uh, bring on the hate. It's all good. That's what I'm fucking here here for. I'm here to find the edges, and uh, I'm not impressed with Edmund uh, to the fullest extent yet. Um, but I would like to see what he does here against Brunson. But as of right now, from everything that I've seen on tape, I'm going with Brunson to win this fight uh, by three round decision. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed the breakdowns. Uh, solid card all around. Some decent spots to to exploit in terms of betting lines. Uh, as of this recording, I have five bets for you guys currently. Uh, again, all accessible on the Patreon, five bucks a month, super fucking cheap, not to mention the early breakdown, early access to the breakdowns that you guys get, all the picks, the best bets article, best props article, it's all there for you guys. Other ways to go about uh, betting my, or purchasing my plays, you can go to the website, mmalotn.ca slash picks, and you guys can check out the betmma.tips profile that I have as well too, Um, that's just lock of the night on that uh, website, that's probably the safest if you guys want to perceive it that way that's the safest way to get my picks but my website's secure patreon's very secure to you and the most cheapest option as well too so check that stuff out um all right that's pretty much it shout out again once again to the tape index if you guys do your own research and you guys want to look up these fights yourself the tape index saves you a bunch of time we do all the the browsing for you so all you have to do is just bookmark the tape index go to the tape index whenever you want to do research and you have every single fight that you need to watch or you want to watch for every single fighter coming up uh, on the upcoming card and you just click it bang boom you got the fight right in front of you whether it's a weird russian sh- site or yuku or fucking ufc uh fight pass whose search engine is just complete dog shit the tape index is there to save you time so you can just focus on studying and not really have to worry about browsing the internet possibly getting a virus or some shit the tape index is here to save your time so make sure you check out the tape index that's in the description as well all right we're done for this episode i'll see you guys next week for uh what's the august 8th show oh Derek lewis versus alexei olenic which is a juicy card for betting in terms of the odds that I've already skimmed. But I'm going to get into studying those fights very, very shortly. And if you're a part of the Patreon, you're going to get those breakdowns a lot earlier than the public. So uh, again, always plug in the Patreon. I, I know that's my, my my saving grace right now because it's going to it's gonna break me break me from these chains of the, the 9 to 5 that I'm currently on. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Good luck on your best this weekend and gamble responsibly. Yeah.